I missed you tissue so paper. much, darling. I knew where it was, top shelf of the pantry. But it's not there well, anymore. There's silence of the sand. How do you expect me to know well, where anything I is if you keep moving them all the time? Why don't you make one? I've got lifetimes <laughs> worth of books and videos to occupy me. <laughs> you never so don't worry to about me. So I'm just going to come right out and say it. I think Starfield was a mistake down to its very concept. On paper, the idea of Starfield sounds like the perfect Bethesda game. That go anywhere and do anything concept of theirs taken to its most extreme logical conclusion. It sounds like a match made in heaven as that concept has been the ultimate goal for many other space games of this class over the decades. Your Star Citizens, Elite Dangerouses, EVE Online's, and many others. From here on out, I'm just going to call this vaguely defined genre of large, open-ended space adventure games the big space game. Technically, many of them are classified as space sims. However, Starfield defenders have been using the fact that Starfield isn't technically a space sim as a means of deflecting criticism and comparisons to other space sim games, despite Starfield borrowing heavily from the genre and Todd himself citing many of them as inspirations for Starfield. So let's sidestep the definition issue by using a different label altogether. I don't think the big space game genre has been saturated or really has even had its true touchstone game yet. I also think there's a place for a big space game that's less simulation and more action adventure RPG. I just don't think Bethesda was up to the task they'd underestimated as Starfield reflects a lack of understanding of genre and an inability to think beyond the type of game they've been making for two decades. This is a hard game to make, and that's mostly due to the combination of scale and genre here. Space is big, and science fiction tends to include a lot of technology that's meant to make the impossible possible. One of the many challenges in game design is to fake scale and to satisfactorily explain why limitations exist beyond just, we don't have the tech and manpower to make a game that big. When you're dealing with something that's, in terms of human scale, nearly infinite, and in terms of modern sensibilities, pure magic, you got a recipe for a lot of headaches as a developer. This is where the scope of a project really comes into play. Scope needs to be defined by the vision for the project. What is this game supposed to be, and what sort of experience is the player supposed to have? Ultimately, I think Bethesda failed to adequately answer either of these questions for themselves when making Starfield, and that's because the answers were either antithetical to the genre and type of game they wanted to make, or weren't in line with what they were used to doing, or they simply lacked the creativity and skill needed to pull them off. The fact that we got tons of interviews and several marketing campaigns for Starfield that never really settled on a succinct pitch indicates to me that there never really was one. If we go by what Pete Hines said during an interview at Gamescom, Todd's pitch was simply, I want to do a massive outer space game and I want to call it Starfield. While there was probably more to the pitch than that, and a pitch to an exec is different than a vision statement to a team, the final product sure does end up feeling like that's about as much as they were working off of for most of the time. It sounds like the hope was that Starfield's identity would form as more systems and content fell into place. The various teams would be given a lot of freedom to interpret what a Bethesda game set in space would look like, and eventually that would come together to make a cohesive experience. The problem is that it doesn't sound like things are really coming together. Their past projects always had the benefit of working within well-established IPs with plenty of games to reference in better-defined genres. Starfield, on the other hand, was a new IP in a genre of science fiction Bethesda had no experience with, going after a type of game that has yet to truly be nailed. While the freedom a new IP and a vague vision statement provides can help unleash a lot of creativity, it can also lead to a lot of tire spinning and a product that ultimately doesn't commit to anything. Evidence of the tire spinning can be seen when you got Todd admitting that the game wasn't fun until a year before its September 2023 release date, and if there's one thing we can say about Starfield, it's that its disjointed experience never really comes together to mean anything. The problem with the Bethesda game in space idea is that there's a lot of vagueness there that, if left undefined, is going to result in different incompatible interpretations. As well, I just don't think that their type of game is compatible with the big space game. So let's take it from the top then. What is a Bethesda game? Now, I'm sure some people will disagree with what I'm going to list, but I'd argue Bethesda has essentially been making the same game since Morrowind. While the priorities and quality has shifted from project to project, these features have all been constant since the early 2000s. 1. A large, handcrafted open-world map designed to be fully open to exploration. 2. 
a gameplay experience that focuses on player freedom built upon exploration, combat, looting, and character progression. And three, a large cast of NPCs, many of them named, that the player can interact with, who provide lots of quests ranging from little side jobs to larger main storylines and faction tied quest lines. Right off the bat, a large handcrafted open world design is pretty much impossible in the big space game. Even if the technology and resources existed to make a world that detailed at this scale, the end product wouldn't be that much better. Planets in the big space game are not meant to be fully explored down to every square inch. They are too big, there's too many, and it won't be a fun experience. So already we're at an impasse. We either have to compromise on the scale of the world so that we can get that classic handcrafted Bethesda map into this game, or we gotta change how the exploration experience plays for Starfield. Well, despite conflicting messages in Bethesda's marketing, they went with the latter and to devastating results. A gameplay experience built around player freedom is perfect for this type of game though. Go anywhere and do anything is pretty much the big space game to the T, and building that experience on exploration, combat, looting, and character progression is what a lot of them end up doing. But with exploration completely changing from previous Bethesda games, how that core gameplay loop is going to look is ultimately going to change too. On top of that, you also need to have spaceship combat because that's what a big space game needs. So, okay, combat is going to be changing too. With both of those changing, naturally looting and character progression's gotta change too, and suddenly, what seemed like a sure thing we could depend upon is full of unknowns we gotta answer. So then we gotta ask, how do we begin to design cities, NPCs, and quests when we don't even know what the exploration, combat, looting, and character progression is going to look like? I think I've already demonstrated in just a couple of minutes why this was, if not a terrible idea, at least a seriously challenging one. And we haven't even gotten to defining the in-space part yet. You see, we only just finished explaining how translating the Bethesda formula to the big space game is almost untenable. Now we gotta start answering genre questions about this game's world building that will be congruent with the vision we've completely lost focus on and the technical boundaries of the game itself. Bethesda's answer to these massive questions was just to start working on the game. And honestly, putting your head down and grinding out some demonstrations is actually a great way to work through a problem. However, when you take those demos and just start building off of them, even if they didn't provide you with a vision, you're going to end up with a messy, poorly defined product and a lot of reworking of ideas. This is exactly what happened in Starfield's case, and it was exasperated due to the scale of the game and the fact that it's a kitchen sink product that's meant to say yes to any idea the devs were coming up with. This is how we end up with the tonal clash of Cowboy Town, Discount Night City, and the Googleplex all existing in one game. Not only that, with how Bethesda likes to design their games, they never want to make players commit to anything. Don't like exploration? Don't do it, just stick to the quests. Don't like combat? turn down the difficulty. Don't like leveling? Pick some random stuff and turn down the difficulty. Don't like looting? Just don't pick stuff up. Simple. While I think a lot of their previous games' shortcomings can be tied back to this fear of making players do things in their games, I think Starfield suffers from this issue the worst to the point that it makes the player question why they're even playing the game once they start to see through all the smoke and mirrors. This leads to an experience that feels incredibly unrewarding, so a game that's meant to inspire a sense of adventure instead murders it out of fear that the players aren't going to like what Starfield has to offer. Starfield is that maxim of appealing to everyone ends up appealing to no one applied to every aspect of an entire game. But even if players are willing to buy into what is being offered in Starfield, it won't take long for them to realize how wobbly those elements of the game truly are because they must rely on cheap tricks and gimmicks in order to exist independently of Starfield's other elements. Ship combat is pointless because space exploration is dull. Space exploration is dull because traveling through space is dull. Traveling through space is dull because there's no mechanics to support it because Bethesda didn't want to commit to any survival mechanics such as limited ship fuel. There's examples like this all across Starfield, leading to a total collapse of the game due to a lack of a core experience. Then you layer on a truly uninspired world with bland writing that is constantly contradicting itself, and you got a recipe for a game that's pretty much designed to bore its audience. Maybe Bethesda could have skated by releasing this game last year when competition in the RPG space was non-existent, but being sandwiched between Baldur's Gate 3 and Cyberpunk 2077's massive overhaul and expansion, yeah, it's no surprise Microsoft's last-ditch hope is already falling off the radar a month after its tepid release. 
While Bethesda designed Starfield to be open to expansion with mods, patches, and DLC, we're going to look at why that just might not be enough, because at its core, Starfield is a disjointed, hollow mess that, in the pursuit of having 1,000 procedurally generated planets, ended up abandoning some of Bethesda's biggest strengths. Exploration has been receiving a lot of flack from Starfield's fans and critics alike, and it's not hard to see why. The consensus has mainly focused on barren planets, lots of mandatory fast traveling, and repetitive dungeons as the culprits. However, the issues run much deeper. Exploration is where every bad design choice in Starfield crashes together to drag the whole experience down to some new lows for Bethesda. It truly is a collection of all the worst elements of exploration from every Bethesda game since Oblivion, with a nice helping of No Man's Skies as sloppy seconds. You got the dull, repetitive, purposeless combat arenas of Oblivion's dungeons, the ugly, empty emptiness of Fallout 3's Capital Wasteland, Skyrim's vibe-checking dragon encounters, the resource-farming hell of Fallout 4 and No Man's Sky, and the pointlessness of Fallout 76's exploration. Prior to Starfield, the express intent of every Bethesda game was to get players out of the cities and into the world and its dungeons, hence why quests often treated those parts of the game as destinations. Starfield presented a challenge, though, because what existed outside of those settlements was almost all procedurally generated maps peppered with some handcrafted points of interest. The fear at Bethesda was that not all players would appreciate the experience of wandering procedurally generated planets and the emptiness of outer space. That fear was confirmed when people online were raising concerns about those very elements when they were shown off at the first Starfield gameplay reveal at the Microsoft Showcase in 2022. As a result, or more likely in anticipation of those complaints, Bethesda made exploration in Starfield completely optional. With the abandonment of a singular handcrafted map in exchange for countless procedurally generated ones, and the reduction of exploration down to just an optional checklist of pointless chores, Bethesda effectively sabotaged two of the strongest pillars every one of their games since Morrowind has been built upon. And so there was a big design kind of problem to solve in terms of, well, what's fun about landing on a planet where there's potentially nothing? And so we spent a lot of time figuring out, okay, let's just lean in on that can A, be a lonely experience, as long as we tell the player, here's what's there, here are the resources that are there, go find them. But I equate it to that moment of we said about listening to the wind go and watching the sunset. And I do think there's a certain beauty to landing on a strange planet, being somewhat the only person there, building an outpost. And we are modeling all of the systems because that's how we like to do things. So you can watch whatever that gas giant or moon it will rotate and go and sunrise, sunset, and all of those things that you would expect, and it's it's all really happening. I want to go do that and see that on that place, as long as we tell them, hey, the quest leads over here, here's where the handcrafted content is that you would expect, and then here's more of the open procedural planet experience. So you, you're Long answer, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> That's Todd Howard struggling to explain what makes exploration fun in Starfield seven months before the game is to release. At that point, he should have had a really succinct phrase he'd repeated a billion times to his team while working on the game for eight years. Remember, this is supposed to be Bethesda's core competency. World design and exploration are two things Bethesda is known to be masters at. However, when Made for Wanderers is the best you can come up with, it's pretty clear there was no vision for what's arguably the most important element in Starfield. At least Todd tried to explain some sort of appeal, as opposed to Ashley Cheng, managing director of Starfield during an interview with the New York Times. The point of the vastness of space is you should feel small. It should feel overwhelming. Everyone's concerned that the empty planets are going to be boring. But when the astronauts went to the moon, there was nothing there. They certainly weren't bored. Not every planet is supposed to be Disney World. Ashley Cheng is, of course, missing the fact that those astronauts weren't bored because they were in constant mortal danger no human had ever faced before. They were also scientists there to perform experiments that would have tremendous value for validating theories going back to the days of Isaac Newton. They were also acting as living icons so that their country could win huge points in a high-stakes geopolitical game that was reshaping the world as everyone knew it. Players aren't going to be thrilled by the primordial fear of a horrific death, or the the honor of fulfilling the legacy of generations of scientists, or the pride of representing their nation in the greatest way possible. I hate to be one of those people, but it really is just a game, bro. 
Todd is definitely closer to an actual appeal Starfield's planets could have. He's right in thinking there's people out there who would enjoy sitting there watching the sunrise and set on an alien planet and taking screenshots of the pretty skyboxes. There's definitely a vibe there to be sure. However, those players are going to be a minority, and they were already satisfied by the handcrafted maps of previous Bethesda games. By servicing just one niche of players, you've effectively alienated most of the people who come to your game for its exploration. This is where I have to wonder if Bethesda actually understands why people enjoyed exploration in their previous games. Because this is all starting to sound like they are simply assuming that exploration in a video game is intrinsically fun. This is the same faulty assumption made by countless developers who have stuffed dull, pointless open worlds into their games. Wandering a virtual world is not fun in of itself, at least not for very long. Not after the novelty of what the player is seeing wears off. Exploration needs to be supported by some other system, be that combat, crafting, questing, character progression, role-playing, or player-to-player -player interaction. It's honestly pretty arrogant to assume players will just aimlessly wander your game world simply because you made it. However, this arrogance is not at all surprising when it's coming from a studio that has been bragging about modders fixing their games for years while touting how this game will be a modder's paradise. Truly, we are beyond the point of Bethesda expecting players to fix their games for themselves. We've now entered a point where Bethesda expects players to make their games fun for themselves. What's fascinating is that even though Starfield has combat, crafting, questing, character progression, and even some role-playing, none of those elements ever tie back into exploration in any meaningful way. This is because, once again, Bethesda was afraid to make players engage with the empty planets portion of the game because they were afraid to make players engage with any portion of the game. This is reminiscent of another game of theirs that has been very divisive, Fallout 76. It wasn't the map or the dungeons that let exploration down in that game. In fact, I argued in my 76 video that both of those elements were perhaps some of the best work Bethesda has ever done. No, the fault was in the pointlessness of exploring the map and its dungeons. Stick with 76 long enough and you'll come to realize the foolishness in simply exploring and clearing dungeons for its own sake. Quests, events, and daily grinds will naturally be sending you all over the map and into its various dungeons. If you aren't tackling some sort of chore while doing your exploration, you're just making more work for yourself and falling behind on your grinds. While Starfield and 76 share the pointlessness of exploration and the dishonor of being the lowest rated Bethesda games on Steam, Starfield at least evades the 76 issue of saddling the player with tedious grinds by making all of its tedious grinds optional. This is where we bring out subject number two. No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky is a survival crafting game to its core. Its gameplay loop consists of collecting resources on the surface of planets so that you can survive the elements in order to fly to another planet and do it all again. It also has a codex you can fill by scanning things, base building, dungeons, a main quest line, and many other side things, but that gathering crafting loop is the main aspect to its design. It's not really my thing. I always thought it felt like it was all the tedious parts of the genre with none of the benefits, but it's got a strong following, and at least it has a core experience it never abandoned. Starfield's planet exploration borrows heavily from No Man's Sky. You got the resource gathering, the scanning, the base building. Starfield copied No Man's Sky so much it even copied all the parts people hated about that game, such as the miserable inventory management. The key things Starfield lacks are those survival elements. Planets do have some elemental hazards, like high radiation, in extreme ambient temperatures or toxic atmospheres. While these hazards can cause some mildly annoying stat debuffs, none of them will outright kill you. Originally, they were much more punitive, but it was determined during development that they should be heavily nerfed down to just being some flavor that's meant to trick the player into thinking they are more important than they actually are. So the way the environmental damage works in the game on planets and on your suit, and that was a pretty, it's a pretty complex system actually. It was very punitive. So we kept trying, where you get these afflictions, we kept trying to tune it. We get a point where we're tuning it and you're having to heal those things. We just made, we just nerfed the hell out of it. Hmm. Where it ends up being, it matters, but only a little bit. It matters more in flavor. Like the affliction you get is more annoying knowing you have it than the game result. Because if we dial it way back, it becomes more flavor on the screen than it does a gameplay system. Ship fuel was another survival element that was diminished so much it might as well just qualify as being cut at this point. 
it's still kind of in the game. You need fuel tanks on your ship and your fuel reserves technically limit the number of jumps you can make. But since your fuel is refilled when you reach your destination, it's effectively pointless. Bethesda assumed players would be turned off by these roadblocks inhibiting their ability to travel across the subtle systems. And honestly, they were probably right. Some players would have absolutely hated it and claimed that it didn't belong in a Bethesda game. My question then is, why not just make it an optional mode? Skyrim and Fallout 4 both got survival modes post-launch, while 76 launched as a genuine survival game. They know there's a demand for this sort of stuff in their games, and here was a game designed from the ground up to be a survival game, only for those elements to be cut in the 11th hour. So why not just make it a setting in the options menu? I think anybody who's made a game with a team of any size that's listening to this, that change moment where you you know if you're a creative leader, like, eh, we probably need to get rid of that. We probably need to change it. And you just like dread the conversation. Yes. I've never played a Bethesda game I've wanted a survival mode for more than Starfield. Sure, it'd just be copying even more from No Man's Sky, but hey, so long as the lawyers are happy, who really cares? This would give outposts more of a purpose. It would require me to be a lot more thoughtful with how I'm traveling between planets and star systems, and it would make reaching the edges of the settled systems feel accomplishing. So it turns out, there's really no reason to walk around the surface of planets. No, seriously. I was going around clearing pirate dungeons trying to gather some loot, and I found the fastest way to do that was to land on a flat, barren planet, get out of my ship, and look around to see if there was a pirate dungeon within 500 meters of my landing site. If there wasn't, I just opened the surface map, picked a new landing spot, and in less than 10 seconds I had a new map. The game weighs the POIs so that there's a high chance of a dungeon being close to a landing site, so I'd only need to re-roll the map maybe three times before I got a dungeon. The game doesn't even try to impede this process either. There's no going back into orbit or anything like that. No, it just teleports me to a new map already out of my ship and ready to go. It doesn't even subject me to watching the ship landing animation again. It's so convenient that I cannot imagine this is not the intended way to explore in this game. Well, either that or Bethesda just didn't think I'd notice walking around planets was pointless. I mean, considering they thought I wouldn't notice planet hazards and afflictions are pointless, I'm kind of leaning towards them assuming that I'm just an idiot who will walk off my ship and start wandering towards the first map marker that pops up on my screen. There's one change here that they could make that would curtail my landing site hopping strat, and that's to make traveling between landing sites consume fuel on my ship. Of course, this comes with the risk of me getting stuck on a planet if I can't scrape together enough fuel to leave the surface, and as Todd said, it would slow the pace of exploration down. That's not necessarily a bad thing though, assuming you have a method of last resort to unstuck a player, and the player is fine with a slower survival crafting experience, which, like I said, could just be toggled in the settings menu. Instead, the rate in which you can knock out planets in this game really comes across as Bethesda being embarrassed by how they turned out. In my honest opinion, Fallout 3 managed to make wandering a barren wasteland interesting. Sure, the capital wasteland was kind of ugly, you know, game from 2007 and all, but there was actually a bit of beauty in that ugliness, and exploring the wastes really was a vibe. It's not something that can carry an entire game, and Fallout 3 doesn't make the entire game about exploring the barren wastes, but it really did a great job of helping create some peaceful moments between the more hectic insanity the other parts of the game presented. The capital wasteland and the DC ruins work well off of each other to create some interesting and meaningful contrast. Hell, even the metro tunnels are a more fun and immersive means of connecting locations in Starfield's space portion. Speaking of which, while Bethesda's botching of planet exploration is pretty much inexcusable as it required ignoring two decades of success at it, the disaster with Starfield's space portions can at least be chalked up to a lack of experience and an underestimation for how difficult it is to make space interesting from a gameplay perspective. Ship combat and space exploration are two elements that receive the most development time, seeing constant changes throughout the entirety of Starfield's eight years of development. It was one of the first systems they'd built for the game, and it was still seeing tweaks and total reworks a few months before the game's final release. In terms of getting feedback and being willing to completely change it, and that kept it moving forward, and then we'd try things and we'd, we'd go all the way back and then take a different route on it. And well, their attitudes about it, like they embraced it. Yeah. Like, let's redo it again. Like, can we? Okay, we're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> a breakdown of ship combat is best saved for the dedicated combat section, but as it pertains to the experience overall, it's really reminiscent of how random dragon encounters were the touch of death for exploration in Skyrim. You'd be walking around picking flowers and looking for the next Nordic ruin to raid when suddenly. This is it then. Look after yourself. Uh, you better come back to me. 
If your build wasn't designed to account for dragons and you hadn't grinded the main quest to get dragon rend, you are probably in for a bad time. With how bad these fights generally were, when coupled with their unpredictability, they really turned out to be a wet blanket for exploration. Ship combat in Starfield managed to invoke that same sense of dread. If I wasn't in a ship equipped for combat, or if an elite ship spawned in the ambush, or if the game just decided to reset my power management settings for no fucking reason again, I knew there was a good chance I was going to be reloading in a few moments. Random encounters are the name of the game in Starfield space. When you jump into orbit, the game does some RNG to determine what is going to happen. Sometimes it's a group of pirates who will just attack on sight instead of trying to rob you. Sometimes it's a lone trading vessel, or it's a funny quirky couple arguing over open comms, or it's grandma, or more likely than anything else, it's nothing at all. And of course, there's no system to prevent encounters from repeating themselves, so have fun listening to the Valentine filling your comms with unsolicited singing while you wait for a grav jump. Notice how I keep saying jump when talking about space travel. This is because there's no way to seamlessly travel between planets or star systems in this game. Now, I wasn't one of those people expecting Starfield to allow seamless entry to a planet's atmosphere from orbit like No Man's Sky or Elite Dangerous. I also wasn't expecting planets to be one large procedurally generated map that I could endlessly wander. No, my wake-up call was in figuring the grav jumps we saw in the marketing was going to be reserved for traveling between star systems and little else. When it came to traveling between the planets, moons, and other things within a system, I figured we'd have some method of travel that lands between combat flight and grav jumping. What I did not expect were loading screens and lots of menus. The easiest method of travel the game heavily encourages you to use is popping open the system map, navigating to the star system and planet you wish to travel to, fast traveling into orbit, and then picking a landing site from the planet surface map. The immersive method of space travel involves getting into your ship's cockpit, launching into orbit, and then using your ship's targeting system to pick a destination to fly to. However, this is such an awkward and inefficient method of travel, the game doesn't even advertise it. All it's really doing is adding more loading screens into the equation. You still need to use the planet surface map to pick a landing site, so it's not entirely menu-free either. Likewise, unless you have the entire settled systems memorized, you'd still need to pop open the star map to figure out which systems connect to one another at which point you might as well just cut out the busy work and use it to fast travel. All of this menuing, fast traveling, and loading screens really fragments the experience of traveling through space. While I'm sure some of it was implemented for technical reasons, I can't help but suspect the fragmentation of planets within a system was an intentional design choice for the sake of player convenience. However, this has a tremendously damaging influence on the sense of scale of the settled systems itself. One of the joys of Elite Dangerous's interplanetary travel is watching a tiny faint dot of light off in the distance slowly materializing into a giant planet that fills your entire screen, or seeing the true scale and layout of a star system thanks to the most Ocean of the different dots of lights. It's a small detail, but one with massive value as it allows the player to see the Euclidean relationship between these objects, creating a sense of scale by offering a perspective you just can't get from maps and static orbits. This is how you create that overwhelming feeling Ashley Cheng was describing. It's a powerful tool that Elite Dangerous never forgets to use. It starts with establishing the scale of a planet, and then a star system, and then a star cluster, and outwards it goes until the player zooms out to see the whole galaxy and their mind basically shatters. This never fails because Elite Dangerous never betrays the illusion. Elite Dangerous never allows you to skip a system. You see every jump and every star. You see every planet and manually dock at every station. When in a system, every meter is felt. Every light second is witnessed. The only time it yields to convenience is jumping to a new system, and that comes with a whole bunch of other things to consider. The Settled Systems is a big place, but it's made to feel incredibly small, almost stifling. This is due to its inability to express its scale in terms the player can understand, and the fact that you can travel across it in a matter of seconds. You only have to manually grav jump to a system once. Once it's no longer red on the star map, you can just fast travel to it or fast travel through it on your way to your next destination. Elite Dangerous might sound boring, but it really isn't so long as you're on board with the game being about traveling. There are so many mechanics tied to traveling between and through star systems fuel reserves, heat management, jump drive range, and ship mass, just to name a few. Then there's incidents along the way, such as pirate interdictions, which are not unavoidable random encounters, but instances that can be predicted based on the state and security of a system, and avoided with careful navigation, ship upgrades, and just pure piloting skill. 
Starfield's ship and space mechanics are so woefully underdeveloped that none of this gameplay is possible. Ships in this game are much closer to what they are in Destiny, visual flair to look at as you menu to your next destination. We can debate over what features Starfield should and shouldn't have since it's not a space sim like Elite Dangerous. However, there still needed to be a decision on what the space portion of Starfield needed to be. Is it just a place for ship combat? Is it a place to explore space stations and derelict vessels? Is traveling supposed to be meaningful? In all of these categories, Starfield fails to deliver because it's clear it was never decided on what it should be. Whereas Elite Dangerous knew exactly what the different stages of its space exploration gameplay was meant to do. Frontier then home owned mechanics and systems meant to sell that experience. I'd be remiss in not mentioning the mod someone made for Starfield that allows for a more cohesive, seamless flight experience between planets. It achieves this mainly by just making your ship move super fast and then adding a hotkey to load the cell the destination planet is contained within. While this mod does better help sell that sense of scale I was talking about, it doesn't add any extra gameplay to the experience, essentially just making it an even longer loading screen. The author admits this is about as good as this mod is going to be until modding tools are available, so maybe down the line they or some other ambitious modders will be able to get interplanetary gameplay to exist. It all comes back to Bethesda not wanting to force players to engage with the mechanic. If you don't like the space stuff, just menu through it with fast traveling, and if you do get into a fight, spin up the grav drive and jump to the next location. They were so uncommitted to making Starfield about anything that they made space in a space game optional. If that's not a clear indication that Starfield was a mistake, I don't know what is. But uh, yeah, Fallout 3. I think its exploration hits the way Todd and company were hoping Starfield's barren planets would hit. When I was on the moon wandering around ancient facilities that helped humanity escape Earth, I was really getting a whiff of some of those Fallout 3 vibes. It was kind of cool. It's only a whiff, however, as the similarities are barely surface level. It really does just come down to aesthetics. Wandering a barren landscape peppered with some old industrial sites is about all the two share. Oh, and the ugliness. Let's talk graphics. Out of the box, Starfield is a pretty ugly game. It has moments, but for the most part, it's surprisingly drab. A lot of that comes down to just one thing, a lack of a brightness or gamma slider. No, seriously, millions of dollars of art design is being held back by a fucking slider. The game's default brightness seems to be set to cell phone screen in daylight mode, resulting in everything looking really washed out. Fallout 4 had this issue a little bit and 76 got it even worse somehow, but Starfield hit a level I found so insufferable I had to get a mod to correct it a day after release. I imagine the brighter image is meant to help people who have screens with poor black levels. As for the blue-gray filter they slapped over the entire image, that's meant to evoke some sort of aesthetic of old science fiction films and TV or something. All I know is that it was giving me a headache after only a few hours of playing. The issue was most prevalent in dungeons when I'd be looting and I was genuinely struggling to spot objects because they were blending in with the environment in this soupy gray haze. So yeah, I committed the analysis video faux pas and modded my game. It was either that or keep a bottle of Tylenol next to me whenever I was recording. The reshade preset I used still wasn't a perfect solution because lighting in this game is pretty wonky. This resulted in me fiddling with the reshade settings and the game's graphic settings a lot during my playthrough. So if my footage looks very inconsistent, yeah, that's pretty much why. On top of the intense gray-blue filter, you got your usual suspects of bad lighting and shadows, overuse of post-processing effects, inexplicable ambient lighting, and too much fog all robbing the image of some much-needed depth. Wouldn't it be a Bethesda game if we didn't need mods to add darkness to a game with flashlight? The game does have a pretty striking color palette, and exterior lighting can do a decent job at times, especially on the empty planets. But for every pleasant, screenshot-worthy vista, you got half a dozen really unpleasant ones with muddy, low-resolution textures, seams in the terrains and biomes, or just bland, unfinished geometry at the edge of the map where the fog fails to conceal where the landscape renderer stopped. Starfield also doesn't get scale right at all when it comes to geographic features. Mountains straight up don't exist, probably because climbing them with our weak boost packs wouldn't work. Likewise, canyons don't exist. You can sometimes find a crater, those look kinda cool, but once again, the scale is usually wrong and even on planets with crater biomes, there's just too few of them. No volcanoes, geysers, fault lines, scarps. I'm not saying that they need to have implemented the entire Wikipedia glossary of landforms, but there's honest to god more terrain variation in Minecraft than here in Starfield. 
While it is an unfair comparison to make because the game was designed from the ground up to be as realistic as possible, Elite Dangerous did manage to leverage its realistic scale to make some interesting gameplay. You can spend hours roaming through a crater in a buggy, or speed through canyons tens of kilometers deep in your ship. It's actually a lot of fun, and once again achieves that thing Ashley Cheng was talking about with being made to feel small by the scale of space. But, oh right, we can't fly ships when on a planet, and we don't have exocrafts like a buggy because we got the boost pack. I actually have a sneaking suspicion land vehicles were planned to be in this game. Something always struck me as odd with the landing bays for the ships in this game. They all have ramps. It was actually the Strauss Eklund landing bay that clued me in when I noticed it had stairs as well as a ramp. Why not just the stairs? Why require landing bays at all? Why can't I exit from a hatch from the top of my ship? They finally added ladders to this engine and NPCs can even use them. These bays are just acting as doors anyways, unless they were meant to house a little buggy or something like that. Okay, maybe I'm just reading too much into an art asset, but I think everyone is on the same page with how much better traveling across planets would be if we had some kind of vehicle. The most likely reason for their exclusion is technical. If Bethesda was struggling to get horses to work in Skyrim due to them letting players run faster than the renderer could handle, I can only imagine the issues a buggy would present. Or maybe it was a physics thing. The carriage ride in Skyrim's intro famously caused Bethesda all kinds of issues, which is likely why we got vertebrates in Fallout 4 instead of a vehicle with wheels. At any rate, the boost pack simply doesn't cut it. It's too weak, and unless you have your boost pack training skill maxed, you're going to spend a lot of your time just waiting for it to recharge. So it turns out there's two types of jumps you can get out of your boost pack. Normally, the boost pack just acts like a double jump. Tap the spacebar once and you do a single jump, tap it twice and you get a boosted jump. If you bind a secondary key for jump and use that instead of the spacebar, you'll actually perform a different sort of boost jump that provides a bit more horizontal thrust. If you use a balanced or skip rated pack, you'll get even more of a horizontal boost. This actually makes a noticeable difference when walking around, and once I discovered it, I was using it all the time. I honestly cannot tell you why this is not an advertised feature when boost packs were expected to be our primary means of traversing planet surfaces. Oh yeah, did I mention boost packs are gated behind a perk? Anyways, graphic tech is only part of what contributes to Starfield's bland visuals. Its art style is another sore spot. Now, I wouldn't be as hard on the fact that the art style in this game is so inconsistent, but when you make a big deal over your style to the point of giving it some pretentious name like NASA Punk, I'm kinda left assuming consistency is to be expected. It looks as though some designers were on board with the style while others were not, and none of the managers put their foot down to get everyone on the same page. Like I said, this sort of disparity is how you got three main cities that don't look like they belong in the same universe together, let alone one that's supposed to be vaguely function over form. Some of the spacesuits rock the NASA Punk look hard, such as the Constellation suit while others, like the Freestar Collective gear or the Crimson Fleet stuff, looks like impractical cowboy LARP costumes and knockoff Warhammer Space Marine armor respectively. The Mantis armor looks like something out of Star Wars. Then there's the Starborn armor I wore for most of my playthrough, which looks like it's ripped right out of Destiny. On the ship end, I think the NASA Punk theme fares a little better, but like the suits, it varies between the different manufacturers. Nova Galactic and Deimos both stick to the look, while some of the other manufacturers go for sleeker profiles with ample cowlings and rounded modules. I'm more fond of the ships than the suit, but that's because the aesthetic looks best when it's leaning into the industrial look. I guess that's the NASA part, I'm still not sure what part is meant to be punk. Guns were another hit or miss category. The old Earth weapons were neat because it's kind of hard to mess up an AK or a 1911. Even some of the tactical future guns like the Breacher, Grendel, and Beowulf I kind of dig. But then you got the Lawgiver and some of the other cowboy crap that just get a hard pass. I understand Firefly had the cowboy look, but there was an in-universe reason for that. It wasn't just because they liked the aesthetic. Obviously, art style is just that, style, but I really do love when a game's art style supports its world building. Starfield's NASA Punk fails on that front, however. I think the biggest example of that failure is when exploring the ancient ruins on Earth and the Moon and seeing everything looking exactly the same as the rest of the settled systems. It's actually kind of funny in a sad sort of way. The character who invented the grav drive justified his actions by saying he saw glimpses of human art and society in the future and was so moved by it he felt compelled to design the drives even though he knew it would destroy Earth. Cultural artistic expression reflects philosophical evolution, interest in growth, perspective, observation, interpretation. Suspect you won't see any art in collector base. Culturally dead. Tools for reapers. Worse than the Geth. 
No art, no culture, closer to husks than slaves, tools for reapers. From an aesthetic standpoint, my favorite parts of the game are the industrial sites and the research facilities. The industrial stuff looks like some super polished Fallout assets free of the ugly played out 50s postmodern shtick, while the sciencey tech stuff seems like a second attempt at the Institute style from Fallout 4 executed much better. Gagarin and Sidonia are two examples of places I think land well with their aesthetic while staying true to their world building. But bringing it back to planets and exploration, where the NASA punk aesthetic is completely absent is with the alien flora and fauna. If the design ethos of the human-made stuff is mildly function over form, the alien stuff is all style over substance. Plants are these over-designed, exaggerated things, several times larger than the player in all sorts of colors that do not correspond to any natural adaptation for their host planet. Animals are even worse, however. These are straight-up creatures ripped out of No Man's Sky or Spore. Almost every creature is some kind of giant insect. Sometimes you might find a giant bird, or something resembling a dinosaur, but you'll never find something like a small woodland mammal here on Earth. In fact, I don't think I ever found a creature with fur. Once again, none of these creatures look like they'd have been the result of any sort of evolutionary process that would give them a competitive edge in their natural environments. They look like they were designed in the concept art stage, and they were just never called for consistency. So we got ugly barren planets that oftentimes look like tech demos to show off methods for procedurally generating terrain, and even uglier lively planets crammed full of garish and visually clashing assets that looked like they'd been whipped up by undergrads for their 3D art class. Neither of these make exploring planets for the visual spectacle at all appealing. Surprisingly, even Starfield's music is uninspired. It's a very uninspired mashup of generic orchestral pieces and what sounds like leftover bits of Fallout music, which makes sense. This soundtrack is the work of Anand Zur, whose work on the Fallout soundtracks usually nails it. In fact, his previous Bethesda soundtrack with Fallout 76 is a genuine treat. It not only meshes flawlessly with its associated game, it also works as excellent cruising music when you're driving through the mountains of West Virginia. I'm starting to think Bethesda was taking it for granted that Jeremy Sol and Anand Zur were absolute professionals and masters of their craft who could repeatedly pull incredible work out of thin air. Bethesda got used to being able to have a banger soundtrack guide them on how to make a game that fits the music. I don't think the fault lies with the composer here. Zur can deliver the goods, I just don't think he was given any sort of direction for what Starfield was, aesthetically speaking. Music is one of the first things Bethesda likes to have done, but when you're dealing with a new IP that ultimately came out as an uninspired generic mess of clashing styles, scoring a good soundtrack to that is going to be a serious challenge. The only thing you can do is play it safe, and that's the best way I can describe Starfield's soundtrack safe and uninspiring. It might make for some good background music when you're studying, but for backing up the action of combat, think so. I even did a test where I threw on some music from another game I thought could work with Starfield's combat and the results were night and day.
You can even see how much more aggressive I got when I was jamming out to the Osho soundtrack. The exploration tracks are a little more on target when wandering barren planets, mostly because there's not much music at all during those sections. However, what passed in this game as dungeon tracks is a bit strange. A lot of them sound like town music, which comes across as entirely inappropriate when looting an abandoned facility full of dead bodies. It was made even more inappropriate when the combat music wouldn't play, so I'd have this town music going as I was adding some fresh corpses to the dungeon. Alright, let's talk content. Points of interest, or POIs, refers to all the locations the Planet Content Manager, or PCM, populates a landing site with. Everything the PCM will spawn, from dungeons and outposts to caves and other natural formations, is handcrafted. This means the amount of proc gen content in Starfield is actually quite minimal, limited only to the terrain itself for the landing sites and the radiant missions and random events if you want to be a pedant. What surprised me and many others is just how repetitive these POIs truly are. We aren't talking Oblivion Repetitive, where you got 90 caves that all look very similar because they share the same tile set, but have different layouts and enemy spawns. I mean, if you've seen one POI cryolab, you've literally seen them all because the game only has the one cryolab it's gonna keep spawning. Same layout, same enemies, same terminals, same key cards, same clutter, same dead bodies in the same dumpsters that Remorgan will always stop to comment over. The only variation in these places will be the levels of the enemies, the gear they got, and whatever spawns in the dungeon's containers. Everything else is identical. Now, this wouldn't be a big deal if there was a large pool of POIs the game could pull from, but there isn't. I'm gonna list the numbers of what I'd consider to be dungeons in previous Bethesda games, and I'd like you to try to guess how many we've been able to confirm exist in Starfield, a game made for wanderers that hosts over 1,000 different planets and moons. Oblivion, around 250. Fallout 3, around 140. Skyrim, around 200. Fallout 4, around 250. And Fallout 76, around 300. Now, these aren't exactly apples to apples, as this is going off of map markers. Fallout 3 sounds pretty tiny, but it actually has a lot going on in the DC ruins where each neighborhood could be considered several dungeons tied to one or two map markers. Starfield has around 40 unique POIs that are not just natural features that are only used for completing planet surveys. And that 40 is being inflated some by civilian outposts, ship landing sites, temples, and gravitational anomalies which aren't dungeons at all. I'd also argue crashed ships and many of the one structure ruins don't make the cut either. So if we're just comparing your usual Bethesda dungeons, we're in the neighborhood of around 20. I uh... Maybe the thought was that the planets themselves should count as dungeons, or even the individual landing sites. Yeah, we'll go with that. I made a prediction on X, formerly known as Twitter, stating that the landing sites wouldn't be much bigger than something like Blackreach and Skyrim. While that turned out to be incorrect, landing sites are actually about the size of Skyrim and Fallout 4 in terms of surface area. In terms of content, it's pretty damn close. Forget about immersion, this is just awful in terms of fun. I would try to play devil's advocate here and posit that the generic POI dungeons are super limited, but the game has a ton of handcrafted dungeons that the quests send you to, but that's not the case either, as the place I saw most of these generic POI dungeons was in the main fucking quest. The Crimson Fleet questline had maybe five unique dungeons if we really stretched the definition. There's a few side quests that send you to some unique dungeons, but not many. My point is, there aren't two to three hundred dungeons hidden somewhere in this game. This is... Wasn't this game in development for eight years? I'm sure the first year or two was mostly engine and concept work, and we had 2020 happen, but still. Skyrim was in full development for three years by a team a fraction the size of the one that worked on Starfield, and that game blows Starfield out of the water in terms of quantity of dungeons alone. That's to say nothing about the work that went into the spaces connecting those dungeons together. I figured, seeing as we weren't going to be getting a singular handcrafted map, Starfield was going to be absolutely loaded with POIs. I figured it would take hundreds of hours to really see everything that could possibly spawn on a planet. I was bracing myself for years of 10 places you've never seen in Starfield videos. Instead, you really can cover all of it on a single planet in about 10 landing sites.
Where did all that development time go? Because I got news for you, the quests and the handcrafted content is also surprisingly scarce. Bethesda kept throwing around the phrase irresponsibly large, but I'm sitting here left wondering where two thirds of this game is. Now, I'm not a quantity over quality guy. I'll take a few dungeons in favor of them being really well designed and open to all kinds of playstyles. But not only are there fewer dungeons in Starfield overall than there are alien ruins in Oblivion, these dungeons really aren't anything special. I have a lot of thoughts on Fallout 4 and 76, most of them negative, but one thing I will give them unconditional praise for is dungeon design. Bethesda really did nail making those spaces feel lived in and grounded. In particular, factories and military sites were some of my favorites, not just because they were usually good places for loot, but also because they were visually distinct and usually had intricate layouts that I could get lost in. They made me curious as to the purpose in their world, and that would get me to poke into some terminals or even just take things a little slow and let my imagination fill in some of the gaps. While the realism-bound nature of the design often made them less flexible in terms of playstyle, they were still overall the most fun parts of their games, all things considered. But it wasn't just their interior design that impressed me, the amount of work that went into their exterior design was equally as impressive. Bethesda would rarely just drop a dungeon out in the middle of an empty field and call it a day. They would spend a lot of time blending it into the environment, designing different approaches to the places, and oftentimes linking them together with nearby locations so that I was naturally led through these different zones that often would get me to explore several dungeons back to back. While seeing as POI dungeons are just remote facilities on remote planets, that whole second aspect of design is pretty much impossible. These dungeons really are just boxes dropped out into the world. Sometimes the area around them might be developed. You might have some dudes guarding a loading dock or a landing pad, maybe a couple of smaller support buildings, but it's not like these places are attached to other dungeons to create an industrial complex or a remote mining village. So already the dungeon design has taken a few steps back from what even Fallout 3 had going on, leading us to our final comparison, Oblivion. Oblivion-esque is about how I'd describe Starfield's dungeons overall. While you have your usual Bethesda environmental storytelling with some terminals and journals lying around the place, they are, like I said earlier, exactly the same from the first abandoned UC listening post to the 10th. I honestly don't know why they'd even bother with the terminals and stuff then, but whatever. So with these places being robbed of any sort of in-universe purpose, we are back to dungeons just being places we go to fight and loot. No pretense for anything else. Just go in, clear the place out, and move on. Just like Oblivion. Some of the dungeons try to cater to different play styles with ventilation systems you can use to sneak around and shortcuts and alternate passageways being blocked off by a pickable lock, but this is not something you can count on as a stealth player. More often than not, there are no vents. There might not even be an entrance outside of the front one. Some places might have security systems you can reprogram, most don't. So even in terms of variety and flexibility, these dungeons fail. They're also just not very elaborate, perhaps some of the smallest dungeons overall I've seen in a Bethesda game. Let me tell you, Fallout 76 had some mind-bending dungeons that you will get lost in, which made the removal of the local map a really questionable choice. A design choice that actually carried over to Starfield, but at least they threw us a bone by building Skyrim's clairvoyance into the scanner. However, the quickest way out of a dungeon is just to fast travel out of it, another feature carried over from Fallout 76. According to Todd, they moved away from maps for dungeons because they felt if a player had to refer to a map to navigate one of their dungeons, then they failed as level designers. Okay, but why don't we have maps for cities? Is that to keep the online map and guide writers employed? I find it rather telling that Bethesda is willing to inconvenience and frustrate the player simply out of pride. Todd recently stated how Starfield was designed from the ground up to be a game open to having more content added to it. That the launch game was just a platform for delivering more content in the future. Is that why dungeons are so lacking? Are they going to sell us POIs as DLC? Do they believe modders will fill the system? Or did they figure the exploration of barren planets was never going to match up to the experience of their previous games and so they shouldn't even try? We, we have this phrase, you know, put it in the spotlight. There are things you can put in the spotlight. You can make it more important just with game symptoms or you can make it less important. So sometimes a way to fix things is like, we should make that less important in the game. Yeah. Um, we do that with, you know, horses in Skyrim. They're just not that important. Exploration in Starfield sucks. It's sad because that didn't really need to be the case. 
Even if it was just wandering proc-gen planets populated with a bunch of handcrafted dungeons and whatnot, that could still have been a decent experience if there was a breadth of content. I've seen a lot of players bouncing off the exploration part of this game hard. This usually then leads to them eventually dropping Starfield altogether because that has always been the core of Bethesda games. It's not like the other aspects of Starfield are a huge step up compared to their previous offerings. If anything, the other aspects are made weaker by the collapse of the player's desire to engage with Starfield's world. When Todd said exploration in Starfield was going to be different, I really didn't think he meant removed. Starfield's complete failure to make exploration engaging has revived a debate that I've seen pop up whenever a new Bethesda game comes around. It's this idea that what made Bethesda games good back in the day just isn't cutting it anymore. Competition has gotten too stiff and Bethesda needs to start taking notes from The Witcher or Zelda or Dark Souls. While I agree, in terms of writing design and mechanics, Bethesda can absolutely learn some valuable lessons from those games. In terms of exploration and world design, uh, I don't really buy it. First, I want to shoot that argument down that the Bethesda formula is dead. No, it isn't. What we've seen in Fallout 4, 76, and Starfield is Bethesda shortchanging the strong exploration elements of Morrowind, Bolivian, and even Skyrim to do other things. What you're seeing isn't the failure of the formula, it's the failure of Bethesda to execute on that formula. If the formula was dead, people wouldn't still be playing Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim to this day, begging Bethesda to just make another Elder Scrolls. A game like Ardenfall wouldn't be able to grab people's attention by just looking like a spiritual successor to Morrowind. The Bethesda formula is something wholly unique. The reason no one has tried to emulate it is because even Bethesda doesn't actually understand what that formula is. People just really don't get Bethesda games because there's so many layers and overlapping systems you gotta pull apart to get to the heart of what makes those old games great. Also, not for nothing, they are a hard thing to make. Up until Starfield, I still thought Bethesda was ahead of everyone else when it came to designing big open worlds. Their unique focus on systems really did lend their worlds a certain tangibility no other developer seems capable of replicating. If there's one game I think Bethesda could take notes from, it's Red Dead Redemption, especially RDR2. It's not even the world design itself, which granted, RDR2's map is stunning in size, detail, and just raw beauty, but rather, it's how the game uses its map. RDR2 heavily focuses on the minute-to-minute -minute traveling through its world. It's a game that has a fast travel option I rarely want to use because traveling on horseback and getting sidetracked to check something out along the way is the beating heart of that game's experience. That's an aspect of their game Bethesda has never perfectly nailed. A Bethesda game that really focuses on the world, its scale, and the means of traversing that world I think would be the Bethesda formula perfected. However, looking at how awful traveling in Starfield is, I seriously doubt Bethesda will ever commit to something so bold. So yeah, maybe the Bethesda game is dead because Bethesda will never make it again, but the idea of a detailed world you can genuinely lose yourself in certainly is not. Combat is the part of the game that received the most attention during development, and it shows as it's the only part I'd say manages to rise to the lofty heights of mid to kinda decent. The ground combat anyways, the ship combat, we'll get to that in just a second. We are in some dire need of a little positivity right now. Ground combat feels pretty decent. A refined Fallout 4 with space magic that actually ties in pretty well with the rest of the combat. There is melee and hand-to-hand combat in this game. Hand-to-hand -hand even has some perks tied to it. However, I stuck to ranged firearms for my playthrough, so I can't really speak to how good or bad those parts of the sandbox are. I will say the weapon selection for melee is very limited, and I really can't imagine rushing a level 90 equipped with a modded magstorm with nothing but my fists. It looks like the two playstyles require a lot of planning, metagaming, and just pure luck to be made viable definitely not recommended for first timers. As well, while stealth is in this game, I once again didn't engage with it outside of some incidental sneak attacks while sniping. It's another playstyle that requires some perks and planning. It's also not as crazy powerful as it has been in previous Bethesda games, so they may have finally tamed the stealth archer meme here. Ranged combat is, without a doubt, the star of the show. There's a huge array of firearms, all organized into different types, with skills and perks associated with them, a decent number of mods you can slap onto them, and if all of that wasn't enough, there's also the legendary effect system from Fallout 4 and 76, which can really start to get your head spinning. 
While some of the weapons can start to feel samey due to the sheer volume of them in the game, and some of them are outright trash while others are godly, I was actually surprised how distinct most of them felt, with legendary effects doing things like dealing more damage with consecutive hits, random elemental damage, or staggering enemies, that distinction is felt even more. Your guns tend to shape your playstyle, which I actually really enjoyed and felt worked well with how looting in Starfield goes. Just like in Fallout 76, weapon enchantments make no sense in universe, but I honestly don't care as they really do add a lot of depth to combat and character progression. In Starfield, weapons and armor are tiered based on the number of effects an item has. Common, which has no effects, Rare, which has one effect, Epic with two effects, and Legendary with three effects. As well, weapons have quality levels associated with them that determines how much damage they deal. Basic, calibrated, refined, and advanced. Armor has its own quality level naming convention as well as its own set of legendary effects, but the same principles apply. Armor has been slimmed down as the only armored slots we now get are spacesuits, helmets, and packs. There's an underlying apparel slot that can offer some very modest bonuses, but mostly it's just aesthetics. Just make sure to toggle the setting to hide your armor in breathable environments in the spacesuit menu. Over the years, Bethesda has been flip-flopping with how they do armor. You had Oblivion slimming down the number of equipment slots for Marwind, then Fallout 3 brought it down to just armor and a helmet. Skyrim expanded that a bit by giving us boots and gloves back along with a ring and necklace. Fallout 4 tried to bring armor pieces back, but its implementation was really jank as only some underlying apparel slots even allowed you to equip armor pieces with them. 76 addressed this issue by letting you equip armor pieces with any apparel. It would just make the armor invisible if it wasn't going to play nice visually with the underlying outfit. Finally, we got Starfield walking it all the way back to Fallout 3, but giving us backpacks as a consolation prize. I'm not a fan of losing control over my equipment and my looks, especially when the name of the game these days is offering players as much control as possible over their appearance with things like vanity equipment slots and such. Likewise, I'm not a fan of losing potential slots for more equipment effects. However, I will admit, not having to sift through tons of armor pieces and trying to get a full set I'm pleased with is an improvement over the hell that became in Fallout 76. Armor also has different damage type and environmental hazard resistances, but like I said earlier, the latter is almost entirely flavor meant to trick you into thinking it's something you should really be concerned with. Really, all you need to pay attention to is the damage resistances, random enchantments, and aesthetics. The problem with the random loot system in Starfield is that it's random. While I do enjoy the fact that I gotta build my character around my arsenal, which makes for an interesting early and mid game, it ends up having a seriously destructive influence on the long-term progression of characters. The randomness, coupled with New Game Plus, encourages the player to avoid investing into pretty much any weapon-specific skills. And, well, there's quite a few of them, and those are arguably the most effective and interesting skills. The randomness also means you can just continuously lose to RNG and keep pulling up weapons you don't really want because the odds of getting exact what you want are astronomically low. As well, you can keep pulling up weapons that have effects like Spacer, which is without a doubt a bad effect, as its buff when in space combat will hardly ever be active since space combat hardly exists. Meanwhile, its substantial damage nerf in surface combat will almost always be felt. I can't tell you how many guns I instantly ignored just because of this effect. I feel like changing it to react to interior and exterior combat would have been a much better effect. We still have no way of being able to level up armor or weapons, which was a huge issue I had with Fallout 76. So if you find a really awesome shotgun in terms of effects, but it's the lowest tier quality level, there's really nothing you can do with it except deal with its low base stats or vendor it. I still don't see any reason why we can't improve the quality rating of guns and armor, seeing as we have workbenches for this stuff. Weapon mods pack a lot of potential, and like in Fallout 76, there's some surprising synergy you can stumble across with things like white hot mods adding fire damage and perks that would then buff that fire damage. There's a good amount of variety to really make weapons feel more distinct, and they even improve the modding menu a bit to be a little more upfront with what stats the mods affect. Overall, I just don't have a whole lot to say about the system as it's almost entirely the same as it was in Fallout 4 and 76. Armor mods are a little more debatable, and that's mostly due to the utility of armor being a little more dubious thanks to the nerfing of environmental hazards. While damage reduction is nice, I really didn't feel it a whole lot between my best armor set and some mid-tier trash. 
Really, what ends up making and breaking armor are the effects that are on it. Armor mods seem to just be a replacement for some perks with some damage reduction effects thrown in. It's very anemic, which is strange because there's no visual component to armor mods as there are with weapon mods. You would think then it would be no real challenge for the designers to just stack armor with all kinds of stat altering mods. So let's talk about ground and space combat. Space combat is not ship combat. Rather, it's engagements that happen on ships and space stations. Despite what the marketing had me believing, space combat is actually pretty rare. Being restricted to only a few space stations and large ships you'll mostly see during certain quests, and boarding actions if you decide to disable a ship in space and dock with it. While the latter is pretty underwhelming due to most ships being too small to make boarding them interesting, the former tended to be some good stuff, especially when the designers threw zero gravity into the mix. Zero-G works surprisingly well. It takes what you know about combat and turns it on its head in a really good way. Suddenly, all those heavy-hitting shotguns in your arsenal become a liability as the recoil is going to send you flying across the room. Cover completely changes, encouraging you to start thinking more creatively with navigating in a 3D environment. Even things like how you peek from cover in Russian Enemy is made so much riskier. That is, when the AI is able to cope with the switch-up. Sadly, Zero-G is just not used very often. I suspect it came down to dungeon design and uncertainty whether it was going to even be in the game. Still, if Bethesda is actually committed to making Starfield a content platform, more Zero-G stuff is a no-brainer in my opinion. I did find out recently that there's a chance for some Zero-G combat when performing a boarding action. I just never saw it because I rarely performed boarding actions as the reward for doing them was rarely worth the effort. Surface combat is the bulk of the on-foot action, and like I said earlier, it's pretty solid. What ends up holding it back is balancing AI and level design. Level design and AI kind of goes hand in hand here. I would routinely see AI give up strategically superior positions just to rush out in the open and die even though they had rifles. Or I'd see them struggle to pathfind on some catwalks or through tight corridors. Or I'd see them get themselves stuck in airlocks and doorways. Sometimes they'd hide behind what barely even qualified as cover. A lot of it would boil down to a lack of situational awareness on their part. AI just isn't capable of understanding their surroundings and using that to their advantage. This ends up encouraging the player to just sit and wait. In no time at all, the AI will most likely put themselves into a compromising position. This is unfortunate because we have a few mobility options, such as the boost pack, clambering, and even a combat slide that all seems to encourage an aggressive playstyle. However, combat isn't really designed for constant aggression. That is to say, it doesn't necessitate you use those options and get good with them. While it can sometimes outright punish you for being aggressive thanks to busted enemy level scaling, it doesn't really discourage aggression a lot of the time. It's more like the game just doesn't care. And so you can either play it safe and be bored, or play aggressively, have more fun, but occasionally trip over the unpredictable roadblock up ahead. For the most part, the AI has access to these mobility options as well, but they hardly ever utilize them, and even if they do, it's often to their detriment. This ends up turning a lot of combat arenas into a playground for the player and a prison for the AI. AI tends to have the biggest advantage when the player is assaulting the exterior of a facility and the AI has defensive positions, cover, turrets, and traps at their disposal. This is where ground combat feels the most dynamic. I'm forced to get a little more creative with what I'm using and how I'm approaching the enemy. It also gives the mobility options more room to shine. This really changes though once we get into a building and suddenly it seems the enemies are there just to act as cannon fodder as I clear through rooms like a one-man army. The only wild card the AI seems to be able to pull is to retreat further into the dungeon and group up with their allies. They won't alert those allies and get them to come back to my position to reinforce the allies whom I'm busy slaughtering, so I guess we're still stuck in Skyrim in terms of enemy AI intelligence. What can put a stop to the whole show, though, is when you run up against a random legendary enemy or an enemy equipped with one of the brokenly OP weapons. Legendary enemies make a return from Fallout 4 and 76. Actually, they don't really have a fixed term here in Starfield, so I've seen some people even calling them epics. There's a chance you'll sometimes run into an enemy many levels higher than their allies, who will have multiple health bars and are oftentimes capable of dealing out some serious damage. These are meant to act as boss encounters. However, since they are random, they often end up acting like a bucket of ice water during combat instead. You'll be rolling through and suddenly you hit an enemy that's eating your bullets for breakfast and potentially melting your health bar simultaneously. 
seriously. Some dungeons have encounters where they are weighted heavier to spawn, but oftentimes it just feels like total randomness. This completely breaks the flow of combat and not in a good way that encourages adapting and experimenting. Usually, the solution is just to fall back on whatever boring cheese strat you've discovered because getting creative when facing these sorts of enemies is usually met with instant death. When all else fails, you can usually just sit back and whittle them down with some pot shots. The random weapon check is even worse, however. Because this game is a visual mess in the art style department, reading enemies from a distance is basically impossible. However, even if you can properly identify the weapon an enemy is equipped with, you have no idea if that weapon is stacked with enchantments, or is high leveled, or is equipped with some powerful mod. So you might end up in an encounter where the level 70 legendary enemy is being upstaged by the random level 50 dude with a kitted out mag storm that shreds you before you even saw a health bar. Bar. Speaking of health bars, I've seen a lot of people claiming enemies in this game are bullet sponges. For the most part, I have to disagree. While RNG can saddle you with weapons that are woefully inadequate and softly discourages you from investing in two weapon-specific perks, when you are properly equipped, most enemies and encounters end up feeling too easy, especially on the normal difficulty setting. Admittedly though, level scaling in this game is a mess. Levels scale based off of the star system you are in. The starting systems are the lowest leveled systems hovering around levels 5 and 10. The furthest systems cap out at 75. However, you can still see some level 60s and 70s in the lower leveled systems, and vice versa with low levels and high leveled systems. This ends up making a system's level feel more like a suggestion than a rule, particularly when you land in the level 40s and 50s. Those systems can feel almost random with its scaling. Level scaling also affects the quality of equipment enemies will spawn with. I wasn't able to work out how the system works exactly, but it seems like your character level determines what loot spawns in containers, while the system level determines the equipment that spawns on enemies. This means the best way to get high-leveled gear, and make money, is to fight enemies in high-leveled systems exclusively. This ends up having a negative influence on exploration, as you're encouraged to stick to the higher-leveled systems if your goal is to get good loot. This also cuts another way. Because an overwhelming majority of the game's quest content takes place in the low-leveled systems, if you're running through that stuff as a high-leveled player, you're going to be bored out of your mind as you stomp your way through each quest's combat encounters. This becomes even more obvious during New Game Plus, and I think the solution would have been to allow those lower-leveled systems to slowly creep up. It's fine to keep the starting systems below the player's level, but I don't think I should be a level 70 going up against level 5s during major quest lines. Now, you might say I should just increase the difficulty setting if I want those low-leveled systems to challenge me again. First off, even maxing the setting out, a level 5 system is not going to challenge my level 70 character. Second, ship combat scales with a difficulty setting too. And, uh, oh boy, let's talk about ship combat. It's pretty awful. I think it comes down to tuning, lack of tactical options, bad AI, how the encounters themselves are set up, pretty much the whole system from top to bottom. Every ship, enemy and player alike, feels like it's made out of paper. Either shields and hull integrity is too low across the board, or weapon damage is too high. This is coupled with the fact that weapons have some pretty insane range and travel speed, meaning damage is almost always unavoidable, even if you have a ship built for speed and agility. Then you have the combat encounters themselves. Almost every encounter, I was outnumbered 3 to 1. In ground encounters, being outnumbered is not necessarily a bad thing because the player has numerous advantages. Tons of med packs and chems, a giant arsenal they can bring around with them, companions, and when all else fails, better situational awareness and a greater ability to use geography to their advantage. Ship combat is devoid of all of those advantages. What your ship is equipped with is all you got. Outside of ship parts, which just repairs hull damage, there's no consumables you can use in the heat of a battle. While companions can buff some ship systems, we can't form a squadron with ally ships. And with most encounters occurring in empty space, there's not much you can do in terms of maneuvers to gain the upper hand unless you got better engines and shields than your enemies. And even then, if it's a 3 on 1, odds are someone is going to be outmaneuvering you. With so few tactical options at the player's disposal, space battles really boil down to a game of numbers and RNG. Todd said they were having a lot of trouble getting ship combat to feel right. Fights were either too difficult, or they were turning into endless jousting matches as the player and their targets continuously did flybys on one another. Rather than expanding the combat sandbox to give the player more tactical options, they just programmed the AI to be really dumb. 
let's look at how Elite Dangerous does ship combat because it looks like that's the sort of ship combat Starfield was going for. For starters, in Elite Dangerous you got way more tactical options. Silent running in chaff launchers to break target locks, shield cells to temporarily boost shield strength, and deployable fighters to harass and distract your enemy just to name a few. Ships are faster, more agile, and hardier than anything in Starfield. There's also a heat management mechanic in Elite Dangerous that creates more of a potential skill gap that the player can then get good at to exploit in their enemies. However, Elite Dangerous also knows how to set up engagements. Rarely, if ever, is the player just ambushed by three enemies and is immediately under fire. Unless the star system is in a state of war and you wandered into an active battle, NPCs aren't going to freely fire on whoever happens by. Pirates, for instance, will just demand some cargo and run off once appeased. Elite Dangerous never spawns players within weapon range. There's always several seconds to give them and NPCs an opportunity to size up the potential fight and either prepare or attempt an escape. Oftentimes, a fight can be avoided without even dropping out of light speed if the player is paying attention to what's around them via the different scanners. Enemies also have options to give chase, which means the FTL drive isn't a guaranteed combat pass. However, the player also has access to those tools too, so if they want, they can be the aggressor and instigate fights on their own terms. This results in some intense games of cat and mouse that are straight up impossible in Starfield because not only does it lack the tools to make this possible, it also lacks a seamless method of space travel. And finally, Elite Dangerous makes sure when the player is grossly outnumbered, there's allied ships somewhere nearby. Sometimes this is ships that are currently engaged with the enemy, other times it's nearby security ships on patrol. All of this adds up to create many layers to Elite Dangerous' combat. I never got killed and thought I'd been cheated. It was either poor piloting skills, poor planning, or committing to an engagement I should have run from. I really don't think Starfield has enough depth to its ship combat to ever really be good, but it can be at least made tolerable. More ship health, faster ship speeds, more balanced encounters, fewer random ambushes with shoot on sight targets, and smarter enemy ship AI can go a long way. However, I do think there's a lot of negative opinions on Starfield ship combat owed to the starting ship just being absolute trash. The Frontier is, like many other things in Starfield, a newbie trap. You really want to drop that thing ASAP. If most ships in Starfield are made out of printer paper, then the Frontier is made out of toilet paper. The problem is that the game doesn't introduce shipboarding mechanics soon enough, being tied to the second mission in the main story after the player has been cut loose from the mandatory tutorial introduction. Actually, it's even worse because the mechanic is arbitrarily locked behind a perk. So, if the player doesn't have the perk unlocked, they literally cannot perform system targeting during the mechanic's tutorial. Like, seriously? couldn't even give Sarah Morgan the skill so that we'd have a guaranteed way to do it here. Hey, did you know you could actually board the pirate ships that ambush you during the ship combat tutorial? You can even commandeer them and set them as your home ship. This requires you picked a background that gives you the systems targeting skill, however. Systems targeting is a mechanic I was actually surprised to see make it in a star field. This is one of the few things I think might be what saves ship combat as a whole if someone is able to make the tweaks that I listed. Systems targeting is basically Starfield's VATS. Time slows down and the player is able to pick a part of the ship's target they wish to incapacitate. Weapons, engines, shield, or grav drive. The grav drive I find funny because I've never seen an AI jump out of a fight to save their lives. Probably because it's nearly impossible even for the player, but also because the AI is programmed to lose. You'll sometimes hear over comms saying that they are jumping out, and your companions will mention how the enemy can't jump away, so I'm guessing enemies jumping out of a fight was a mechanic at some point that just got cut. Disabling a grav drive might be what gets you 0g when boarding though, so I guess there's that. Anyways, the only system really worth targeting are engines. This will stall an enemy ship and open it up for boarding. Once the player kills everyone on the ship, they are free to hop into the pilot seat and commandeer it for themselves. They gotta get it registered with a ship master if they want to modify or sell the ship, but this is actually a pretty decent way to nab a good ship if the player is able to identify one they wish to steal. The identification part is needlessly complicated because it's difficult to see the stats of a ship, perk gated once again, and there's no way to see what modules are on the ship outside of taking it to a ship master and modifying it. However, if the player decides they want to steal a ship, it does add a fun risk reward twist to ship combat. Where the system targeting mechanic utterly fails though is in being at all useful in actual combat. 
I hate to keep invoking Elite Dangerous here, but in that game, system targeting was a seriously powerful tactic that could level the playing field a lot for a weaker ship. Hit a ship's shield system and your target just lost a huge advantage. Or hit their engines to slow them down so you can make some distance to recover or attempt an escape. Hit the FTL drive to keep them from escaping or pursuing you. Starfield's system targeting mechanic fails here because of the aforementioned low ship health. By the time you've even damaged a ship's engines, that ship is likely almost close to death. In fact, if you don't commit to disabling a system early in a fight, you're likely just going to kill the ship before you disable a single system. Good luck getting two systems down, that's pretty much a guaranteed death sentence for the target. Outside of boarding ships in space, the player can also hijack ships that are landed on the surface of remote planets. The challenge with this method is that most ships will only stay on a planet's surface for a minute or two. So unless the ship lands in front of you, you're likely not getting aborted before it's back in orbit. As well, it's RNG, so the likelihood of getting a ship you actually want to keep isn't all that great. The surest method of ship acquisition is just purchasing one. While I have some genuinely positive things to say about that and shipbuilding mechanics we'll get into later, as in early game method of getting a ship, it's pretty much untenable. Basically, I don't blame players for sticking with the frontier and making the ship portion of Starfield magnitudes worse for themselves because they're so used to not being directed by the game to do something. Anyways, for all the issues I just listed, cranking the difficulty setting and making enemies do more damage to the player while the player deals reduced damage is a fucking terrible idea when it comes to ship combat. We really do need two difficulty settings in this game, one for ground combat and one for ship combat. Before we get into character progression, we really should discuss one more element to Starfield's combat, abilities. I've been calling them all kinds of things during my playthrough. Space magic, space shouts, space thum. You see, these abilities are much closer to shouts from Skyrim than they are spells from Skyrim. We get something like a mana bar when we unlock them, but considering most of the abilities tap out the bar in a single shot, it really acts like a cooldown meter just like how shouts in Skyrim worked. A few of the abilities can be cast in quick succession and there is a resource that acts like a mana potion, but both of these elements come with some pretty big asterisks and there's no perks or skills associated with the abilities. So, Space Thume it is. They're even tied to the main quest, are unlocked with something similar to Skyrim's word walls, there's a group called the Starborn, no seriously, Space Thume works on many levels. There's 24 abilities in total, and if you're familiar with shouts and spells from Skyrim, most of them will be quite familiar. You got Fire Breath, Frost Breath, Unrelenting Force, Slow Time, Whirlwind Sprint, Animal Allegiance, but then you got some new ones like Singularity for Mass Effect, Spawning a Clone of Yourself, Anti-Gravity Field, Turning Yourself into a Rock. I actually enjoyed the Space Doom a lot more than I was expecting. I didn't even mind the long cooldown a lot of them have because many of them can be total showstoppers during a fight. Being able to just spam these all the time would pretty much undermine everything combat has going for it. They're a lot of fun, and while I did find myself gravitating towards a select few, that more had to do with me just finding ones that worked well with my weapon selection and playstyle, and less that it had to do with them being OP. Some of them are kind of worthless, but most have a distinct purpose, and so long as you remember to whip them out, they can do a lot to mix up combat. It's just a shame that most combat encounters are too easy in this game to warrant leaning on abilities very often. Okay, I've talked around the subject long enough. Character progression. Let's just start with the basics. Starfield uses an XP system same as Fallout. Earn enough XP, gain a character level up and one skill point. Take that skill point, invest it into a skill to unlock a new perk. You cannot just pick whatever you want from one of the five categories as skills are tiered in their respective category. You need to invest a certain number of skill points into a category to unlock the next tier. As well, skills have ranks to them, and in order to be allowed to invest skill points into ranks beyond the first rank, you need to complete challenges. On paper, this doesn't sound like a terrible skill system. A bit basic, but it should get the job done. However, a lot of questionable design choices and a maddening lack of information makes it perhaps the worst leveling system I've seen from Bethesda to date. Let's knock challenges out of the way because it's the most straightforward in how it's poorly done. I imagine the thought behind adding challenges to progression was to prevent players from rushing all four ranks of a skill and basically making the middle two ranks less meaningful. As well, it does share a very surface level spirit with Elder Scrolls a system of leveling as you use a skill, which addresses that issue of a character that has done nothing but gun down all their opponents suddenly being a master in speech. I don't have much against the idea of challenges being tied to progression, however, three issues bog the system down in Starfield. 
For one, most of the challenges are extremely arbitrary. It's clear coming up with challenges was a real challenge for the designers. Many skills, particularly ship skills, fall back on just requiring the player to kill X number of enemies, which completely defeats the point of the level as you use it ethos. But then there's challenges that can be completed with 10 minutes of grinding or 5 hours of natural playtime. The graph jump skill is a great example. I just sat there jumping between random systems for a little while so I could quickly polish the skill off, seeing as fast traveling wasn't even counting towards the challenge. The crafting skills are some of the most arbitrary, however. You just gotta craft X number of whatever to knock those out. So those challenges just act as a tax as you spend resources crafting random mods and trash gear, or building outposts just to spam buildings. The second issue is a lot more punitive for no real benefit, and that's the fact that you cannot earn progress towards a challenge unless you have the challenge unlocked for that rank of the skill. So say you don't have any points in security. Any locks you pick will not count towards its challenge progression. Or say you do have the skill, but you don't have the next rank unlocked, and you just finished the previous rank's challenge. Same issue presents itself. The obvious solution here is to make all challenges track their progress, whether you have a challenge unlocked or not. And lastly, you have a complete failure on the UI side of things as there's no way to see what a skill's challenges are until you've unlocked the first rank of a skill. While most challenges aren't really anything crazy, some of them started to get to be so tedious that they disincentivized me from continuing with the skill's progression. Withholding information is the perfect segue from challenges back to skills in general. While Bethesda has gotten better with giving us actual numbers in their perk descriptions, there's still skills like rank 4 fitness that just says sprinting and power attacks now use significantly less oxygen. Or how about the cellular regeneration skill, whose first three ranks simply read slightly increased chance to recover from injuries naturally, moderately increased chance to recover from injuries naturally noticeably increased chance to recover from injuries naturally. Is someone at Bethesda just screwing with us? Or were the numbers for this skill getting tweaked so often that the person writing the description just gave up and started using synonymous adjectives instead of numbers? The ranking system also adds a new level of confusion. Let's look at ballistics as an example. Rank 1, ballistic weapons do 10% more damage. Rank 2 then does 20% more damage. Now do the stack, and that means I'll actually have a 30% increase to damage? No, rank 2 just overrides rank 1. Now, I wasn't blindsided by this because I just assumed it was overriding, but I really cannot blame anyone who thought they would be stacking due to how the UI lists the rankings vertically. But where the lack of information reaches its worst is when looking at skills companions and crew members have. Bethesda made a pretty big deal about companions and crew members being able to share their skills with the player, allowing them to do things like buff a ship's weapon systems. The game will list the same skills the player can see and acquire in the skills menu, however, those skills work differently when being shared by crew members. Now, this wouldn't be a big deal if the game told us how these skills worked for them, but of course it doesn't. Take Sam Coe's piloting skill as an example. At max rank, which he is, the player is supposed to be allowed to pilot the best class of ships. However, piloting better ships is not the bonus Sam's piloting skill offers the player. Instead, it simply boosts the ship's engines. I'd be remiss in not mentioning there's another skill, engine systems, in the same category as piloting that also affects ship engines. There's some skills crews share that people online still have yet to figure out exactly what they do, like those ship weapon skills and outpost engineering. So the people trying to test this stuff are left wondering if their testing methodology is faulty or if the skills are simply bugged. And it's not like we don't have a good place to list this information, we have a crew page we can access at any time that lists our crew, where they are assigned, what skills they have, and even what skills are being shared. When I heard about this skill sharing system, I foolishly assumed that it meant I could hire crew members who could just act as researchers on my ship. Rather than me dumping points into weapon engineering or spacesuit design, I could just burn a couple of crew member slots on my ship and have it covered. I even went so far as to do a social build so that I could have more crew members aboard my ship. Turns out, no crew members have any research skills. Despite having 82 skills in the game with 4 ranks in each, not even half of those are available on crew. And even then, many of them likely don't do anything except act as flavor to explain why they keep giving you sandwiches and rocks. 
Without the foreknowledge of that, I kept avoiding certain skills for half my playthrough hoping it would pop up on someone who I could bring onto my ship. Eventually I realized I got played by the Starfield Direct and started moving away from the social skills build entirely. So with the benefit of crew perks being taken off the table, a new dilemma presents itself. With 328 possible investments, and the game being designed for most players to end up in the 70s, there's nowhere near enough skill points to get everything. In any other RPG, this is of course a positive thing, as it encourages specializing your character and starting new ones if you want to try a different playstyle. Starfield really drops the ball there because, as it turns out, a lot of its skills are either not that great or just outright worthless. This, coupled with the perk gating of a lot of mechanics and a poorly balanced weapon sandbox, heavily pushes players who are paying attention and are not trying to do a themed build like I was towards a very specific character build. Let's just go through the categories themselves. Physical can be quite literally ignored entirely if you are not doing a melee, hand to hand, or stealth build. Weightlifting to increase your carry weight can be useful, I guess. Though personally, I just had a follower to act as backup storage and then I just dump all my loot into my ship's cargo hold. Physical also has all the perks tied to environmental hazards, but with the survival mechanics being gutted from the game, all of those skills are now worthless. Wellness as health increases can be useful if you're dying a lot, however healing items are plentiful enough in Starfield that I never felt compelled to grab this skill. As someone who did a social build, I can safely say most of the skills are worthless, so you can ignore most of this category too. Persuasion's probably the best skill in the category. However, I'd still say you only need about two ranks to pass most of the Persuasion minigames. Leadership is decent if you like having followers, or isolation if you're going it alone. The skills that increase ship and outpost crew size is very debatable, however, considering how worthless most crew perks end up being. Diplomacy, Instigation, and Intimidation are the Calm, Frenzy, and Fear spells from Skyrim rendered in two skills. They're an interesting idea I'm not opposed to, however, the way you use the skills is so fucking awful it made me quit using them after only a few dungeons. They require you to pull out your scanner, holstering your weapon in the process, get into shooting range of the target, activate them, and then scroll to which skill you want to use. These often fail until you get a few points into the skill as well, so you're basically taking a ton of damage for an effect that kinda disrupts encounters a little bit. It's that classic Bethesda problem of why bother using spells to alter the aggression of your enemies when the easiest, quickest, and oftentimes most interesting thing to do is just kill them. There is a nice side bonus with these skills in that they add new options you can use in Persuasion that, at least according to my experience, always succeed. Diplomacy in particular popped up a lot and was often worth quite a few points in the minigame. Fortunately, you only need one skill point invested to unlock these dialogue options, so if you're committed to just stacking speech skills to talk your way through every persuasion attempt, these can justify one point each. Seeing as we're on the subject, let's talk persuasion. We got a new persuasion minigame that blends a bunch of Bethesda's previous speech systems into something that's, mechanically speaking, surprisingly robust. How it works is, during conversations, you might see a dialogue option that has a persuade tag in front of it. Picking that option launches you into a turn-based minigame that has you racking up points in order to win the persuasion attempt. You'll be presented a list of options with a point value associated with each and a color representing the difficulty of the option. More difficult options net more points, and like I said, you can see things like diplomacy and checked options in here too. Picking an option runs a check. If you pass, you get the points. If you don't, you don't. Rack up enough points before you run out of turns, and you'll pass the persuasion attempt. There's also a chance to score a critical pass, which will automatically win the persuasion attempt as well. The system was designed to make persuasion feel more conversational, and I'd say it mostly succeeds in that regard. There is some weirdness to what your character and NPCs are saying during the minigame, though. It can start to feel very artificial in some conversations, especially if you keep losing turns, or you switch from reasonable to threatening dialogue options. All in all, though, I'd say it gets the job done pretty well. Really, the main issue isn't with the persuasion system itself, but how it's used and the fact that it's not an adequate substitute for a proper disposition system. Persuasion is a scripted thing. You cannot just whip it out on any NPC you want like you could Oblivion's Persuasion Pie. I'll give Bethesda credit and admit it was used more often than I was expecting, but it really does take the wind out of a speech character's sails when they only get to use their main skill once or twice during a quest. I wasn't expecting disposition to come back, seeing as it's been dead for a while now, with its remains being stuffed into the companion affinity system. Still, it seems like a missed opportunity not to have some generic version of the minigame we can play to get discounts at shops or get better rewards for completing quests. 
I guess the bigger issue is the complete lack of interaction with NPCs outside of quest givers, companions, and shops. So really coming up with many uses for a proper disposition system is kind of hard. But the complete absence of the minigame outside of quests made finishing challenges for the skill difficult. I really cannot imagine what it would take to get this skill maxed out if you are not running through a bunch of New Game Plus cycles like I was. And next up we got the combat category, and this one I ignored for most of my playthrough as I was way too busy stacking social science and tech as my Fallout 76 Overseer roleplay demanded. Surprisingly, ignoring this category save for maxing out the ballistic skill resulted in combat that was mostly fine on medium difficulty. I think you can safely ignore combat skills entirely so long as you're diligent with looting and maybe tweak the difficulty setting down a notch. So if you're dedicated to some kind of RP or meme builds, you don't have to worry about the combat dragging you down. For the sake of this section, I ended up respecing my character via console commands, because of course there's no way to do that in the base game even though this is a game heavily designed to encourage a single character playthrough. I'm honestly torn on whether I preferred no combat skills or the absolutely stacked character I respect into. I went from having a decent struggle from time to time on normal difficulty in high level dungeons to absolutely annihilating everything on the highest difficulty settings. I ended up switching to a very aggressive playstyle with my combat loadout, and because I refused to pick up any of the defensive perks from the physical category, my character was an absolute glass cannon which did help balance out the combat experience. I think there's a happy medium in here that's probably something like 12 to 20 skill points in the combat category. I also think we're going to need some sort of legendary difficulty setting because even without an optimized gear loadout or relying much on the space theme, it was not hard to run laps around the enemies on max difficulty. I think it's important early on to decide whether you'll be going for combat perks to increase your combat effectiveness or crafting upgrades to get the job done. Pick one of these paths and stick with it until you pretty much start running out of things to put points into. Personally, I'd suggest combat skills over crafting skills because the latter necessitates diving into outpost building and that really seems like a late game system. Or you can skip crafting entirely so long as you're fine with whatever mods your looted equipment comes with. The science category houses all the perks related to crafting and exploration, so either it's going to be a bunch of skills that will be essential for you or a category you won't give a second glance at. As someone who ended up going hard into the exploration part of the game, I invested heavily into it early on. When it came time to do the respec thing, I gutted it almost entirely because I realized how miserable exploration, crafting, and outpost building are in this game, and I wanted nothing to do with any of it after I got what I needed for the video. Outside of crafting and outposts, a lot of the remaining skills revolve around resource gathering and scanning. The resource gathering ones are frankly not worth the investment outside of maybe one point each. The scanning ones are a nice quality of life investment, maybe some decent dump skills if you got nothing else needing your points. Special mention goes to astrodynamics, which increases the jump range of your ship. While Sarah Morgan has this maxed out, her perks only reduce fuel usage, so it's not going to let you make super long jumps between systems. I've seen people arguing this is a great skill, but I gotta disagree as it's really only saving you a few seconds of having to take slightly more roundabout routes if you're doing some long distance voyages. I really can't imagine making a strong case for spending skill points to make the already thoughtless space travel even more thoughtless, unless you got something against upgrading your jump drive. Tech is the final category, and like science, if you don't care about the spaceship stuff in this game, which with how that's almost universally being called the shittiest part of the game, odds are you don't, then you can ignore most of this category. However, I imagine almost every player will have some points invested into this category because it houses the most essential skill in this entire game. Game, boost pack training. I mentioned it earlier, but that nifty jetpack they kept showing off during the marketing is actually gated behind a skill. It's only one point for a tier 1 skill, so if you don't pick one of the backgrounds during character creation that gives you boost pack training for free, this is pretty much the first perk you should pick up, no questions asked. Really, you're going to want all four ranks of the skill to get the most out of your boost pack given just how much traveling on foot you do in this game. I really just cannot wrap my head around why you can't use boost packs at all without rank 1 of this perk, given how much combat and traveling suffers without it. I'd go so far as to say piloting is another must-have skill at rank 4, as it's the only way you'll be able to fly the biggest and best ships in the game. With how poorly balanced ship combat is, and how painfully small most ships' cargo capacity is, you really do want access to those Class C ships. Also, it's a minor thing I know, but why are the worst ships ranked A and the best are ranked C? It's just, it's the little things, you know? 
Security is the final skill in the category I'd say is almost essential. You can get away without investing into it or just throwing one or two points at it, but with how many locks there are in the game, especially during quests, it's hard to pass up entirely on the skill. While I didn't come across any locks that were essential for me to get through to advance a quest, it really was a nice thing to whip out a lot of the time. There's quite a few locks during quests that could save you a lot of time and frustration. However, breaking into locked storage containers was a very mixed bag for me, so your mileage may vary there. I guess I should talk about the minigame scene as I was actually starting to enjoy it once I was able to wrap my head around how it works. Presentation-wise, it looks a lot like the lock-picking minigame we've seen in Bethesda games since Fallout 3. However, there's a lot more going on with it that ends up requiring some neuron activation in order to get through it. The gist is you gotta match the set of notches on the right side of the screen with the slots and the concentric rings on the left side. You can rotate the notches and spend picks to undo mistakes you may have made, and after leveling the skill, you unlock the ability to auto-place some of the notches. The key to the minigame is to plan ahead. Look at all the sets of notches you got, and look at the patterns on the different rings and don't just throw something in the moment it fits because you can have multiple solutions to each ring. Pick a bad solution and you might end up locking yourself out two rings later. I like the minigame because it necessitates paying attention and thinking ahead. There's no time limit, you aren't going to get killed while picking the lock, so there's really no excuse to rush it except impatience, which is totally understandable if you don't get the game or you've been picking way too many locks. However, between skill investments and just playing the minigame a lot, you can get pretty damn fast at it. I started recognizing some basic patterns after a while, which made it a lot easier to punch through even master tier locks. It's a surprisingly engaging minigame that avoids the mindlessness of the old lock picking system and the tedious boredom of Fallout's hacking. Alright, so with all the categories covered, all that's really left to discuss is what this universal build might look like. As I said, boost pack training is a must-have for any character. Not only do you want it, you want it maxed ASAP. Piloting will be another skill you want maxed by mid-game. Security, if you want the options it opens up for quests maybe some persuasion. Depending upon the guns you want to use, your combat skills are going to vary, but at the very least you want to be investing about 12 to 24 skill points into combat unless you plan on knocking the difficulty down or taking things slow. I'd argue ballistic weapons and rifles in particular are the best. Look to stack armor penetration, critical shot chance, and damage, as those effects get pretty insane pretty quickly. Snipers are solid, shotguns can also get pretty nutty. Most of your early game investment should be in here. Don't be afraid to bank skill points for later use. I'd suggest looking at all the skills you want and then creating a rough map for investing into them. The challenges can throw a lot of those plans out of whack, but I do suggest trying to stick to your plan even if it means sitting on a few skill points for a little while. The reason being, level progression in this game can be glacial. Not all activities are created equal. Surprisingly, doing quests is perhaps the least XP efficient activity in the game. The first 10 or so levels go by quickly, but after that, things really do start to fall off. Grinding New Game Plus can net a lot of XP due to some of the XP rewards for those particular quests. I found the most consistent XP gain was just grinding bounties from the mission board. There's some weird crap you can do with outposts to farm XP, but you gotta be pretty dedicated in order to stick with it. Long story short, plan ahead and stick with that plan because you never know when you're gonna hit an XP dry spell. After you got all your essentials out of the way, things kinda open up. It really does come down to what tedious bullshit parts of the game you want to ignore entirely, and what tedious bullshit parts of the game you want to make less tedious. Exploration, stack some of the scanning perks. Social, persuasion, and either companion perks or isolation. Stealth, stealth and theft. Carry capacity, fitness and payloads. Ship combat, don't fucking bother, just get some crew slots with the social skills and stack your ship with companions and hirelings. Maybe grab astrodynamics and the skill that increases power reactor output, dump as much money as you can into upgrading your ship. Then you got your crafting skills. I'm gonna throw starship design in with this slot as it's the only way to acquire the better ship modules. I'd leave these for mid to late game as getting crafting off the ground is a real pain in the ass. Maybe pick the weapon modding skill early just so you can start to slap scopes and rage modifications on some of your guns, but seriously, you're gonna get so much more bang for your buck putting your early points into combat skills that boost the different types of guns you're using as opposed to modding them. As for the spacesuits, most of those mods act as replacements for a lot of the physical skills, so it's definitely not useless 
useless, but not really essential early on. This advice gets less applicable the more New Game Plus loops you do, however. With how looting in this game works, losing all that randomized gear you spent skill points to build your character around might never be replaced. I honestly have no advice here except don't invest much into weapon specific perks until you know you're done universe hopping. It's hard to give any solid advice with this progression system because it's clear Bethesda never had any sort of vision for it. There was no grand plan for how they expected players to navigate it. They just threw a bunch of skills and perks into Starfield without any regard for how the other non-skill systems interacted with it. This is why I think it's the worst character progression system they've ever done. Mechanically, it's solid enough, but there's no cohesion between it and the rest of the game. There's no better example of that lack of cohesion than Starfield's crafting outposts and shipbuilding. I honestly don't know where to even begin with crafting. That is to say, I never found a comfortable introduction point for it while playing. Starfield has perhaps the worst onboarding experience I've ever seen in a modern AAA game, and I've played Destiny 2's recent free-to-play introduction. What is this? I don't even know what the fuck I'm looking at. This is the free- you're listen, you're getting onboarded in, into I, the schizophrenic experience I that am, is Destiny 2, as Todd Howard would say. I'm already lost. The problem with Starfield being such a disjointed mess of systems and ideas is that there's no way for the designers to create a cohesive flow between the systems. Starfield barely does the player the courtesy of introducing systems to them, let alone explaining how those systems work and how they are meant to intersect with each other. There's no better evidence for the onboarding experience being an afterthought for Bethesda than the fact that the tutorials were bugged and kept resetting themselves during my playthrough. Listening to Todd talking about this, though, it sounds to me like he thinks this is a good thing because it gets players talking about discoveries they made about the game. When you get into specific systems, what's good is like you can just show a couple screens. You can show three seconds of footage with a menu. And whereas like on a first view, people don't get it, you know they're going to go on Reddit and other places and tear it apart. And they're just awesome at it. Like they somebody will spend, you know, a hundred hours going through and figuring out what every skill does. Um, we still like and this is hap we've noticed this with it. This is not a surprise for us. I think it's a surprise maybe for the audience. It's a very complex game. And we were okay, for better or worse, with people discovering things in it and sharing that. Hmm. So they're still finding things. By the time this runs, they're still going to be finding things. And I think that is a little bit of a bonus because it is a single player game where people are able to share these water cooler moments the next day be like, did you know you could do this? How do you can? I didn't know that. Why don't they explain that? Um, there's a lot of that going on and that's, you know, understandable. So the dilemma goes like this. I want to start putting mods on my guns and armor, but in order to do that, I need to first unlock the research projects by putting skill points into the weapon and armor modding skills. Once I got the projects unlocked, I then need to complete the research projects, which requires crafting materials. To get the crafting materials in any serious quantities requires either lots of money or diving into outpost building. However, unless I plan on completing only a couple of research and crafting projects at a time, I also need a lot of storage space, be that on my ship, at an outpost, or lugging everything to the lodge, which has an unadvertised feature of giving the player unlimited storage in its basement. Upgrading ships, especially pre-built ships with storage modules, is not a straightforward task because reasons we'll get into, and it's expensive. As well, buying a pre-built with storage space is also expensive and likely requires a high piloting skill. Outpost building is the next route then. However, it requires investing into the outpost engineering skill, which requires building different things at various outposts in order to complete its challenges, which requires lots of different resources, which requires storage space, which requires a ship with a bigger cargo hold, and do you see the problem here? This is what it looks like when a system has no on-ramp. This is likely why I haven't seen any reviews going into outpost building in any sort of depth. They all looked at it, saw no way to naturally get into it, and just assumed it wasn't for them. I don't blame them for doing what Starfield was designed to facilitate and outright ignore a whole part of the game. I do take offense to all the reviews who just assumed outpost building is a good system despite not trying it for more than a few minutes because it's not a good system. In fact, I'd go so far as to say it's a significant step back from what we had in Fallout 4 and even 76. How Fallout 4 created an on-ramp to its settlement building was with Sanctuary. 
A large settlement with tons of resources in a safe part of the map, introduced very early into the game, complete with tutorial quests for all of its major systems. Starfield needed an optional quest like this that would send us out to a location that had all the resources we needed to get a basic place set up. There, it would run us through the tutorials to explain the basics of its systems. Power management, resource extraction, storage linking, defense, crew assignment, outpost linking, just to name a few. None of this is explained in game, so you either gotta go online and watch tutorials, which didn't exist at launch, or do what I did and spend several hours trying to learn the system through trial and error. Even then, gaps in your knowledge will mean you're gonna be screwing something up or left wondering if something is bugged or poorly designed, because how can there be no way to search your warehouse setup outside of walking up and manually going through 20 plus storage containers looking for where the system decided to dump all your aluminum? It's a fucking mess. Out of all the things we've covered so far, no system drove me crazier than outpost building. I think the worst part is just getting another outpost set up because it requires a lot of different materials just to get a very basic extractor going. Far more resources than you'd ever be able to pack onto the frontier. If you don't have a ship with enough storage space to transport everything, you're going to be doing a lot of back and forth between that outpost and wherever you're storing those materials. And yeah, it's not difficult doing the back and forth since you'll just be fast traveling, but it's an extremely tedious back and forth through tons of menus as you're trying to keep track of all the materials you need in order to build a handful of solar generators to power a few minor extractors you built over an hour ago because you needed to run off to Titan to mindlessly farm some more titanium. Once again, Fallout 4 had this figured out. Linking workshops. Go to a new settlement, clear it out, claim the workshop, go back to one of your established settlements, assign a settler as a caravan to that new settlement, and boom, you got access to all your resources at your new workshop. Go back to that new settlement and build it out to your heart's content. Starfield has a system to link outposts together, but this will only transport some materials that are fed into the landing pads. It does not give access to your entire storage system. As far as I'm aware, there is nothing in Starfield that replicates the functionality of Fallout 4's caravan system. While you can get a basic outpost going without any investment into the outpost engineering skill, you'll really want to get points into that skill if you're at all committed to the system. Just be warned, you still need to spend resources on the research projects to finally be allowed to build those bigger storage containers. Also be warned, outpost engineering is one of those skills we still don't know what it does when being shared by a crew member. In all likelihood, it's currently bugged. The only people I've seen getting any sort of mileage out of the system are those using it to build XP and money farms. So I guess it's nice to see Bethesda making a system that appeals to the min-max spreadsheety players again. However, the fact that I haven't seen any articles or videos showcasing beautiful and nifty outposts in Starfield leaves me to believe this system is not nearly as popular among the creative building community as Fallout 4 and 76's settlement system. Outpost building is a very tedious process requiring hours of prep work and doing things in a very specific order just to be allowed to build some prefabs. While I do kind of like the aesthetics of outposts, particularly my warehouse setup, this is a very inflexible system. This isn't a system where you're allowed to build structures one wall at a time. All the structures are just boxes that snap together. These are just giant empty rooms that don't inspire creativity. As well, placing the prefabs on anything other than flat empty geography is super finicky. I cannot imagine trying to build a base on the side of a hill or inside a crater. Issues like this inevitably drives away players who just want to build cool looking bases, especially when there's so much competition in the base building genre these days. If you look at outposts as a watered down version of a factory building game like Satisfactory, things start to click a little more. However, compared to those games, Starfield's offering looks like a pre-alpha mod. Outposts are too small, the mechanics for building, connecting, and managing machines is too clunky, and the UI is not at all up to the task necessary to keep the player from getting lost in all of this. And at the end of the day, outposts just don't have enough on tap to make it appealing for that sort of gameplay. If you don't want to bother with outposts, but you don't want to rely on the Lodge's infinite storage container, then living out of your starship is your best option. This is perhaps my favorite element of Starfield. Not ship combat, fuck that trash. No, I mean, having your own ship you can build and modify and then flying it around the galaxy. Having a base of operations has been a thing in Bethesda games since before even Morrowind. Where the player chooses to settle down, how they use that space, how they decorate it, all of these things do a lot to make each romp through one of their games feel unique. It really helps color a playthrough and does a lot to create a sense of adventure as that space slowly evolves to reflect what you have accomplished over those many hours. Bethesda has been expanding upon this aspect of their games over the years and to great success, I feel. Bethesda leveraged the opportunity Starfield presented to take that base and make it mobile, resulting in the ship builder. This is perhaps the only truly original element of Starfield that I think is a solid contribution to the space game genre. 
So naturally, it was not the work of Bethesda, Maryland, but instead outsourced to their support studio in Dallas. Remember Jamie Mallory, Sandwich Lady? Yeah, this was her team's project. It's a cool system, but it's got some pretty serious issues. For starters, the controls are very clunky. The system uses snap points the same way the settlement and outpost building systems have used. The snap nodes can sometimes be too close together for the aggressive magnetism to play nicely with, resulting in the module you're trying to place being snapped to all sorts of positions on the ship. There's also a deck layer system you need to cycle through in order to place parts above or below the ship, which only adds to the, I don't know, floaty feeling to the system. Anyways, without a doubt, the best way to build a ship is to hover over a snap point and then open the module purchase menu. This has two very useful benefits, filtering out anything that will not snap to that specific snap point and automatically snapping the new module to that point, removing the need to mess with the floaty controls. So your ship has several things it needs in order to be valid and pass the flight check. It needs a landing bay, some landing gears, a cockpit, a docking port, thrusters, a fuel tank, a jump drive, and a reactor. Weapons and a shield generator are optional, though heavily encouraged. There's more to it than that, though. The bigger your ship gets, the more requirements and limitations are going to pop up. Ships can only be a certain length and width because they need to be able to fit onto landing pads at settlements. They also need to have a certain number of landing gears to support it, so if you're making a long ship, be prepared to start spamming gears to clear the error message. The more you throw on a ship, the greater its mass gets, requiring more thrust, either in the form of more powerful thrusters or a greater number of them. You'll also need a bigger grav drive. This is the dance I kept getting stuck in, as in trying to upgrade one of those things, one or two of the others would then get thrown out of whack until I hit the brick wall that was the reactor size limit. I'm not annoyed by there being limitations. They seem a bit low, but whatever, we'll blame that on console hardware or the game engine. What's really frustrating is trying to find a configuration that actually works. I didn't think my cargo ship was that unreasonable, but it took a good half hour of just messing with different engine and reactor configurations until I found one that actually worked. And I only managed to break out of the circular power management trap by capitulating and cutting down on mass of my ship. What would have helped immensely is if the UI had some way to filter out the modules that weren't going to be powerful enough for my hull mass. Or if there was something that, at a glance, could indicate a module's mass to power ratio. I found the best way to work out what the more efficient modules were was to just look at the most expensive ones and work backwards. However, from my experience, most modules progress linearly. That is, their benefits and drawbacks scale at the same rate. So you're really only paying for more power, which is exactly how you end up creating these sorts of balance loop traps that I kept getting stuck in. The worst part of all of this is that there's no way to save your build and come back to it later, or save a draft you can reload if you get a few minutes into some changes and decide you want to revert. There is an undo feature, but it's so inconsistent it cannot really be relied upon, and once again, it's no replacement for an actual save feature. Considering doing a total ship build from scratch was taking me upwards of two hours, not including painting the ship, a lack of a save feature is a huge issue. It really ends up turning into a battle with the tools as my vision smacks up against all of these limitations, resulting in me making a ship that's not at all how I imagined it, but instead some sort of disappointing compromise. It's clear the system can be used to make some crazy stuff, it's just the very rough edges of the system get in the way of player creativity. Fortunately, I believe most of these issues can be fixed. Whether it will be Bethesda or modders who will clean it up, we shall see. Hopefully someone does, because getting to see a ship I designed rendered into a familiar human scale was a genuinely powerful moment. I've never felt so attached to a base in a Bethesda game as I did with my ugly-ass vault tech themed cargo ship. It flew like a brick, had some horrendous blind spots when piloting it, the interior was a maze, and performance on the ship dropped into the 50s, but damn did I love that ship. Where customization really fails is with the interior, however. I really don't understand the internal logic that dictates how interior configurations are decided when you're connecting the different habitat modules, because most ships feel like they were designed to be the most oppressive, closed-floor, suburban American colonial imaginable. I'd have to take the most confounding, serpentine paths through so many ships, which made it a real pain trying to locate companions who would rather hang out in the cramped landing bay rather than the cushy crew quarters. I really wish we could go in and open up walls and seal off passageways the way we can with outpost modules, or at least see in the builder what sort of pathways and internal connections the game was going to create. There's no way to see what the interiors of the modules look like when in the ship builder. They don't even list what workbenches are included in the modules, so I didn't know my workshop included a research computer, so I ended up tossing an unnecessary science bay into one of my ships as a result. 
I was surprised the outpost building system wasn't accessible when on ships. I figured that was a no-brainer, allowing us to place in couches, tables, display cases, and whatever else. As it stands, we've been bumped back to Skyrim in terms of personalizing our ships, and that's perhaps the biggest missed opportunity with this system. Ultimately though, what diminishes the system the most is what happens once you get into the pilot seat. Space sucks, and so balancing the finer things like weapon loadouts, weight, and jump drive range is all completely kneecapped, reducing what could have been an absolutely stellar system down to just a way to make a nifty mobile base for storing gear and talking to companions. Ships do have one hugely positive influence on the game experience though, and that's by way of acting as a major money sink for the economy. For the most part, Starfield's economy is pretty busted. It's that usual Bethesda issue of too much to sell and not enough things to buy. However, ships end up balancing things out a lot because ships can cost upwards of 100,000 credits, which is a significant sum for a decent part of the game. And because the limitations of ships encourages you to own specialized ships for different purposes, such as a combat ship and a cargo ship, building out a whole fleet can be a massive expense. There's also no way to build ships or acquire parts any other way except purchasing them with credits. This means you can't just go run some dungeons or craft these things. Methods of acquiring gear in previous Bethesda games that always disincentivized purchasing equipment at shops. It would have been neat if we had something similar for outposts where we could just directly purchase everything, as opposed to either farming resources or going around to vendors and buying components we may or may not need. 